to uh, introduce Andrew Bailey. Andrew is the spokesperson for Commerce and Consumer Affairs. Um, Andrew is going to say a few words and then um, we'll hand over to Richard to have a bit of a fireside chat with, uh, with Andrew. So over to you, Andrew. Good morning and welcome. Kia ora koutou katoa, uh, nā mihi nui, hei, uh, ko Andrew Bailey ahau, uh, no Wanganui ahau. Hey, um, thank you very much, Tricia. Hey, fantastic to be with everyone this morning. Hey, I don't really want to talk for too long. I'd rather um, perhaps uh, address questions that uh, people want to put forward. But uh, just some very, very general um, opening comments. The first thing is I think everyone's focused very much around the Credit Contracts Act that needs to be remedied. Um, I think the, it's vitally important that we get this right. And as Dr. Clark said, all parties supported the bill because the intent of the bill was to deal with high-cost lenders. Why we have ended up through the regulations is actually capturing everyone in, to, in terms of both the regulated financial institutions such as banks and credit associations, but uh, right through to uh, the high-cost lenders. And I think the balance there is wrong. We've put up a bill uh, as a way of trying to suggest how we might fix it quickly. Uh, and we just hope that we're going to be able to be part of that process because we do need to get it right. We need to make sure that people can get credit, but also uh, we protect the vulnerable, which was meant to be the intent of the bill. The other aspect is um, Dr. Clark mentioned uh, the conducts of, of financial institutions bill that's working its way through. Uh, that's currently before select committee um, before it goes back into the house for, for a second reading. My my bigger issue that I have is that um, how the construct of the regulations for the financial market have been put together. So if you take the triple C F A, we've got F M A um, who. Uh, sorry, we have um, MB who've written the, the rules and we've got the Commerce Commission who've been talking to all the institutions about how it's going to be enforced. Then we've got the Conduct of Financial Institutions Bill, which is going to be under the jurisdiction of the FMA. What I'm worried is, first of all, the focus. So both bills or acts will require things of regulated financial institutions, which are also regulated by the Reserve Bank. But only the um, only the triple CFA will focus on uh, high cost lending, and then we've got the uh, differences between what uh, certain regulatory organisations will want. So, if, when uh, the conduct of financial institutions bill comes in, uh, institutions will be required to lodge their code with the FMA. So we've now got FMA, we've got uh, MB, we've got Commerce Commission. We've got a reserve bank with a certain role as well. I am concerned that the way that everything's been constructed is actually not that um, helpful. And actually, I don't think we've taken a strategic view on how we should regulate financial institutions. And I think um, that's that aspect. But also, um, I heard Dr. Clark talking about KiwiSaver, and obviously that's very important to members. I think it's really important. Uh, one of the things is, uh, I'm vitally concerned about the lack of investment by normal or ordinary New Zealanders in uh, retire uh, saving for their retirement. Uh, as most of you will know, the average balance is under 30,000 uh, in Kiwi Saver accounts. And we need to make sure that we're getting people to save for their future. And I think that's a crucial thing for New Zealand. Uh, the way that women are treated, um, how young people starting out and work are, are treated and encouraged to join KiwiSaver, I think are crucial points. And the last and third point I just want to touch on, I'm very, very uh, interested in how we make sure we've got the continuum across the capital markets right. So what I'm talking about is how we start with angel investment, how we're going to VC, venture capital, private equity, expansion capital right through the stock exchange. Uh, and so I think there's a whole lot of different aspects in each of those components we need to be looking at how we do. You know, the obvious one is that the uh, New Zealand Stock Exchange, we need to put in place the capital markets report recommendations. But I think there's also a lot more we can do around at the beginning cycle of businesses around protecting their IP and doing things like, such as that, because we just need to make sure that we get the capital markets functioning really well in New Zealand. 
Hey, so um, that's all I want to say. Why don't we open it up and, and uh, have a few questions? Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for your opening comments. Um, you speak about um, the vision um, for the financial services sector and perhaps rethinking that. What, what does that look like from your perspective? So just that was the last point I was talking about. Is that what you meant by that, Richard? Yeah, kind of the, yeah. the vision, the settings, the, the yeah. architecture of the of the sector, I guess. Look, um, uh, obviously, some of you will know that I sort of have a mentioned banking background. So it's an area that I've worked in pretty closely for a long, long time. I One of the big issues with New Zealand is we're not particularly, we're very innovative, but we're not particularly good at commercialising opportunities. I'll give you an example. I went through Scion Research Institute in Rotorua recently, and I know, I know the CEO, he was an old client of mine, but I said to him, there was a piece of sort of plastic there, and I said to him, what's that? And um, Dr. Elder said to me, oh, that's a piece of plastic that we've um, developed here in Scion. What we've done is remove the, the component of the plastic that... Um, uh, gives its longevity and replace it with a timber compound. And that means that that plastic could be put and molded into a um, thing that you could put in your leg, like a hip replacement, but also at the end of the life cycle, you can burn it. And I said to Julian, isn't that sort of revolutionary? And he said, yes. And I said, well, why haven't we taken advantage of that? And the, the simple question is, he said he's struggling to get cash for that, um, take that next stage of development. And I think that's a big issue with New Zealand. We are not good at um, capturing the ideas, we're very innovative, but then actually how we migrate them through into full commercial. And I'll give you another example. I spent years trying to get IP or intellectual property out of institutions like Auckland University. It's very, very difficult to get in at the start and actually take them through that life cycle. And that's what I'm talking about. It's not only um, the capital markets making them work more efficiently, but also how we support businesses through that process. Because there's no shortage of brilliant ideas, is there? Right. I mean, the innovation, small countries have to be innovative. It's just about how you scale it, yeah? Yeah, certainly. And, you know, it raises much wider questions about where we should be doing R&D and what, um, you know, where are our centres of excellence in New Zealand? We have, we have some of them. We need to be careful how and protect them. Everyone talks about dairy and certainly that is a centre of excellence. But we've got some fa fantastic other areas that we should be focusing on. For instance, um, I have the building construction support portfolio. Why aren't we a world leader in seismic engineering of buildings? You know, we're right on the uh, plate, Pacific plate. These are the type of areas that, as a country, you need to be much more strategic about how we grow and, and actually take advantage of some of the natural advantages we have and the people, of course, which is um, where it all crucially starts from. Andrew, just um, thanks for that. Just segueing into the KiwiSaver conversation and, and the reframing of KiwiSaver. I mean, what's your what's your take? What's the, what's the National Party's view on we're 14 years old? It's time to, to look and relook at certain settings, uh, picking up your point around uh, women and um, the, some of the work interruption patterns and how KiwiSaver does or doesn't serve that sector, uh, the question on young people, question on fees. What, what are the things that your party would do uh, should you get into office? Hey, well, first of all, um, I support what the government's done uh, in terms of rebalancing um, away from conservative. Those, those, those things that have been done, we're very supportive of that, and they need to be done. Um, but I think that we've still got a, uh, a major issue um, as an MP, and I mentioned all uh, elected MPs have faced the same issue, is hearing the stories of the young uh, lady hairdresser trying to join her business, and I'm not trying to pick on the hairdressing um, salons particularly, but as an example, and been, uh, when asked whether they could join KiwiSaver, in many cases um, people say or employers say, well, if you want to do that, it's going to come out of your wage. Now, that that is a disincentive at an early age to get people investing for their future and, and saving for their future. I think that's one of the issues that's a major issue. The other big one, and, you know, there's a lot of success with KiwiSaver, but one of the things that, um, you know, I think the figure's about 75% of people have enrolled, but a big 
chunk of people who haven't are actually local uh, uh, contractors, uh, small business owners who all think that they're going, when they sell their business, they're going to make a fortune. Well, I spent 25 years doing M&A work, and often that's not the case. We need to make sure that everyone gets involved in KiwiSaver, uh, even if you have your own business. And then the third thing, which I mentioned at the outset, um, the disincentive for women um, and obviously when women uh, take a break from work, these are all issues that need to be addressed. Um, I'm not going to talk about those today and we haven't really uh, got to a point of um, finalising our thinking around that. But I'm just saying if you were to take a, a total look at KiwiSaver, these are the big strategic issues I think we need to be thinking about in the future. Yeah, because as I mentioned with Minister Clark, we're about to go through $100 billion this year yeah. in total assets, which is a significant pool. Um, and you kind of mentioned the, you kind of mentioned the uh, disengaged, the enrolled, but not contributing part of the community because uh, my business is my super fund kind of idea. Yeah. I mean, do you, is that is that a signal to a more mandated approach? Do you think? Well, I don't know what the ultimate outcome will be, but see, I, again, if you just go back up a level, you know, we've got a stock market with two hundred and seventy billion. We've got a KiwiSaver um, balance approaching 100 billion. Uh, we've got New Zealand Super, what, 60 bill. And we've got a housing stock of 1.6 bill, uh, 1.6 trillion. Um, we've just, as a country, we need to make sure we're getting the investment in the right place. And um, I think uh, there, there's an interrelationship between those that we need to think about quite uh, carefully. And I think, you know, given the scale of KiwiSaver, you know, what the nature of investments that people want to do, one of the things I want to do is like to see KiwiSaver uh, providers being more innovative in terms of the investment products they're offering. Uh, I think that's a crucial aspect. The other thing, and this is slight criticism, uh, I used to actually chair a financial planning company for many years. So this is before I came into politics. So I have a little bit of experience. And uh, where we've gone with regulations around um, advisors, I think, you know, it's been a big focus on fees. Actually, uh, fees need to be in the context of the scale of or the nature of the advice that's given. Because if we keep going down the fee structure, what we end up is just large um, corporates uh, delivering uh, vanilla packages to people. Many cases, people want a, a, ta a tailored package. In fact, value having a personal res relationship with a financial advisor. And the balancing around how we make sure that advisors have an environment where they can advise and yet make sure that the advice they're giving is a prudent, practical and appropriate to that person. Uh, that balance, I think, is a major issue that... Um, uh, is in a major debate at the moment within the industry. And uh, obviously it'll be interesting to see what the FMA um, talk about this later on. But uh, for me, I want to make sure that we don't end up driving the market by going and focus on fees to, towards vanilla big pro, uh, products because that's not going to serve many people that well. It's really interesting, isn't it, that kind of whole debate around where do Kiwis have their wealth? And, and the stats are quite clear. It's kind of in real estate, but but coming up fairly fast and quickly are other asset classes, particularly stock shares and obviously through through KiwiSaver. And getting people comfortable with that idea uh, is, a, is a bit of a challenge because it kind of goes right to the heart of financial capability and how much people know about what to do with their money and when to start and how to invest and so on. Any, any thoughts on that kind of financial capability idea? Yeah, well, just, uh, just um, you know, you talked about shares and Hatch before. Um, first of all, I, I just think it's fantastic they're in the market because that's a way of getting young people, you know, we're all old enough to remember 1987. Um, I remember the day vividly spending an entire day watching the screens um, go red. Uh, but just trying to get people re-engaged in the share market, hey, been fantastic returns in the share market. And for people who don't have the deposit, don't, aren't able to buy a house, um, it's a good entree into the share market and for people to get confidence. But we've got to encourage them to move into the next level of more professional investment in the share market, stock market um, arrangements. So that's a challenge for New Zealand. And, you know, this is where Australia's got a huge opportunity on us. But... Um, 
Yeah, the the whole KiwiSaver thing, I, I just think we need to be very careful about how we support it. Um, and we the awareness of people around the different investment options, you know, it's easy to put in a house, um, but, uh, you know, you've got so many different types of, you know, even if you want property, you can do that through the stock market, as you, as you know, quite easily. Um, but people just simply don't often understand it. The requirements to get an account with a stockbroker, the daunting nature of having to ring up um, the stock broker. You know, we've got a lot of disincentives for people to actually engage in that process. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to segue and change uh, change topics, uh, Andrew. Um, a big potential signature piece of change was signalled a couple of weeks ago by a finance minister with a social uh, insurance Social income insurance uh, proposal. Well, what what's your read and what's Nationals' read on on that uh, policy? Well, um, I had a look at it before uh, last year, um, before it was announced, and looked at the schemes around the world. And you know, the the government's put forward a uh, proposal that you know we need it. I don't think we need it personally. It's a very expensive scheme. It's even far more expensive than I thought they might even contemplate it. Um, uh, it, and it is a tax, you know, they call it a levy. But the big question is, do we need it? And secondly, if you did, if you got past that point, which I don't, you know, I think you struggle with, is when would you introduce such a thing because of the implications um, for business uh, owners and also for employees? And uh, but I think the more substantive issue is, do we need it? And I'm not sure we do. Um, there's a lot of government support schemes around trying to get people back into work. One of the big things, and I'll just give you a stat, you know, we've got 198, 190,000 people on the job seeker benefit right now. Now, that's roughly an increase of about 30,000, 32,000, I think, from the start of COVID, which is only, what, 22 months ago, and roughly about 50,000 increase since uh, 2017. Now, that's an appalling stat because if the, if the incentive of the job scheme is to help people get back into work, um, and I see that one of the requirements they are required to seek work, well, one of the first things this government has done is actually remove the requirement for people on job seek to actually apply for a job. And I would suggest that's one of the reasons why job seek, the number on job seek has increased so much. So... You know, I think the issue is more how do we help people back into work uh, rather than provide lots of money for them to sit and contemplate whether they might want to go back to work and possibly do a bit of training. You know, we want people to do meaningful training so that they actually want to get back and have to get back. And I think just putting up a scheme like this, I'm not sure that they actually will um, do it. It's a lovely, great big government scheme that um, sounds good and it'll be a masterpiece. And in a few years' time, we'll be looking at, you know, the fees won't be at 1.38 or be, they'll be at, you know, $3 or whatever. And suddenly it's a very expensive scheme. Yeah, it's certainly one to watch. I mean, it could be a little early to tell, but, but, but what role do you see for the sector uh, if, if this came in? Uh, for your sector, um, well, I don't see uh, it's going to be administered by ACC, um, so I don't really see much opportunity for you. But uh, from our perspective, we're not keen on the idea um, at this stage. So unless the government brings it in pretty quickly, I don't think we'll be taking it forward. Great. Thank you. Um, just uh, picking up the... Um, the question around digital strategy and the opportunity for New Zealand to kind of be this smart and agile skills and services based centre, uh, which is kind of implied in, in in the whole digital economy conversation. Well, what, what's your take on that and the Nationals' take on that? Well, well, let's just deal with the basics. Um, so we rolled out uh, broadband and the Rural Broadband Initiative, et cetera. Um, I remember writing something just after the start of COVID, a lockdown 22 months ago. One of the first strategies the government should have done is continue to roll out broadband as rapidly as possible. Because, you know, if you take an electorate like mine at Port Waikato, I have posts like Port Waikato, even in the area where I live, which is Karaka, I've got very poor internet. 
Um, but by the time I go in, down into my deep farming area, um, uh, the internet is dreadful. So the idea that people can sit at home or work from home, um, first thing, put the network in. And I think uh, that if, personally, I, if I'd been involved, I would have been agitating incredibly hard to make sure we got the backbone, the network in place. Um, but look, we're very good in uh, digital technologies. You know, I've if you go to the top of uh, the new commercial bay um, tower in the bottom of Queen Street, at, right at the top, the most expensive piece of real estate in all of New Zealand, who's it occupied? Not by a law accountant or investment bank. It's actually op operated by um, a uh, software developer of, of games uh, and very successful business. And I think, you know, there's areas where we could be, um, we are really good, but we've got to make sure we've got the uh, digital um, strategy in place, the networks. Uh, and hey, if you talk to a tech sector, uh, and I put that in sort of the digital, most of them are crying out for staff. God, there's a, one major company in Auckland has just lost a whole stack of um, people because it hasn't been able to get the right staff. And a number of uh, owners of these types of digital businesses are saying to me, look, we're thinking of relocating parts of our business offshore because we cannot attract New Zealand or get them through uh, these young people often into um, New Zealand. So, you know, here we are, we're cutting people off at the, and businesses and business opportunities off by weird immigration policies. Um, but uh, I've got a son that works in cryptocurrency and, th you know, that's a huge opportunity. All them, Some will work and some won't. But we yeah. need to make sure we attract it. It has a huge opportunity. And the best thing about um, the tech sector, and, and um, remember National is the one that's been pushing the tech sector, um, is the reason why we're so keen on it, if you think about high-paying jobs, uh, for young people, uh, where are they going to get it? They're going to get it in the tech sector. They make an incredible amount of money. And by the way, it's very good for attracting Māori, Pacifica, um, because, you know, that's the innovative, something that's quite unique to New Zealand. Those types of skills that those people bring to the industry are fantastic. So we should be embracing it. But, you know, you've got, just got to put the building blocks. In. And this is, this is the difference between having a wonderful aspiration, we're going to be a digital hub, and actually sat, well, sitting there and going, well, what are the building blocks I've got to put in place? And I just don't see that happening. And that's probably a nice way to ask you the final question, uh, Andrew, and that's, that's this kind of outlook uh, question, um, which is uh, reflective. H how's the last couple of years been for you personally, but where do you think we're going to be in 12 months' time? And obviously against that backdrop is a, is a pretty um, intense political um, situation, but there's obviously lots of high stake calls that uh, government needs to make, and that obviously national will need to debate uh, accordingly. Yeah, where do you think we'll be in 12 months? Well, I take it you're not asking me politically, but I'll, I'll answer it from an economic perspective. Look, hey, um, New Zealand has been re remarkably resilient, um, but that doesn't mean that we haven't hurt and we're still hurting. We've got a number of um, business groups that are really, really hurting still. And what I find staggering, you know, I, I spoke about this in the House just the other day, um, the divide that we've got in New Zealand, I find appalling, you know, between vaccinated and unvaccinated, between Māori and non-Māori, um, for those who've owned a house and who don't own a house, um, I find that troubling from a uh, New Zealand Inc. perspective because, you know, I can see it out the front door of Parliament here, that divide is something that's going to take a long time to heal, unfortunately. But economically, um, the biggest thing that's coming down is this cost of inflation uh, and cost of living impact. The impact, and I, we haven't talked about tax uh, today, with tax thresholds, which is another area um, I have responsibility for. But the uh, just the cost on ordinary New Zealanders now um, when they go to the grocery shop and they're filling up, it is quite significant. And that is only going to carry on for quite some periods of time. The supply issues are certainly an element of it, but it's not just that. It's now labour, lack of inability to get labour. And if you ask me, and I have a manufacturing portfolio, I am very keen to make sure that 
we put in place strategies to help businesses deal with that, which means allowing business to buy plant and equipment uh, so they can deal with the labour shortfalls, become more productive. And we just need to be in that game of making New Zealand um, much more, uh, well, less reliant on immigrants, but actually more productive at the same time. And so those are all the sort of things we're going to have to face and deal with. But um, we uh, at, a, at a social level, I think we've got huge divisions, which really, really worry me. Yeah, I, th- I think big challenges in front of us. And uh, Andrew Bailey, a huge thank you. Um, thank you for joining and, uh, and to Minister Clark as well. It's been fascinating to see uh, the Minister of the Portfolio and, uh, and the national view on commerce consumer affairs and a much more macro view. Uh, so to the audience out there, um, a really fantastic uh, political start to the summit uh, today. Uh, Andrew, again, huge thank you uh, and really look forward to continuing to work closely with you in your portfolio uh, into the, the, the months and years, years ahead. And with that, um, let me hand you back to Tricia to formally say thank you and then we will continue on with the program. Thank you again. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Richard. Look, I think we'd all agree, um, Andrew and Richard and um, our our participants on the call, that the financial advice sector is continuing to undergo significant change. So it's important that we engage with the government and the ministers um, to provide you with some guidance and um, I guess on on the key topics that are of interest and of concern to the FSC member base. So thank you, Andrew, and thanks to Dr Clark, both of you, for your time this morning and your observations. Um, Enjoy the rest of your day, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.